tonight on Nation to Nation. Last month, the Prime Minister announced two important laws we tabled this month. An Indigenous Languages Act and Indigenous Control of Child and Family Services. This is all systems go. These are two extremely important pieces of legislation. But lawmakers only have 14 weeks of work left before the next federal election campaign begins. And then, you know, what they're going to do is they're going to maybe table it in late January, early February. And then they're going to say, oh, well, we don't have time for you to do the diligence that you should do it. The NDP supports an Indigenous Languages Act, but where's the promise of sustained funding? The governments, both Liberals and Conservatives, have uh, thrown piecemeal funding, and, uh, and it's no wonder that uh, it's such a struggle to provide uh, Indigenous language uh, uh, supports and, and education. I'm Todd Lamaran, and welcome to Nation to Nation. At last month's AFN Chiefs Assembly, the Prime Minister made a bold promise that an overhaul of child and family services and an Indigenous Languages Act would be tabled and passed before the next election. Because if they aren't, they die on the order paper and it's back to square one, provided the Liberals are re-elected. And joining me now is the Parliamentary Secretary for Crown Indigenous Relations, Mark Miller, welcome. The Shadow Minister for Indigenous Affairs for the Conservative Party, Kathy McLeod and the NDP MP from Northern Manitoba, Nikki Ashton. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miller, I'll start with you. Uh, Prime Minister at the AFN Special Assembly uh, a few weeks ago promised to table legislation in January on Child Welfare and Indigenous Languages Act. How realistic is it that we're going to get these two major pieces of legisl legislation passed before the next election? Well, this is all systems go. These are two extremely important pieces of legislation. Uh, that go to the very core of identity uh, in the case of uh, the child welfare uh, and services reform uh, package that's going to be put through. This is, this is something that, that, that will uh, we'll, we'll start to put an end to, to what is in effect another, another scoop, an institutionalized scoop of children and, and all the terrible effects that, that it has on Indigenous children. Uh, having control over your children is, 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 is the most basic of human rights and goes to the core of what we've been talking about in terms of governance, so too with languages. Uh, we'll, have to have a, we'll, have to, we'll have to push hard. Uh, I hope it'll, it'll garner wide support from, from all the MPs in the House, regardless of, of party, but uh, together we can do it. These are the, we, we've We've undertaken to, to do this and co-develop this with, with, with First Nations. So there is a time period and a lag that that creates, but we couldn't do it otherwise. Is it perfect? Uh, it, 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 it is an ideal, uh, but it's the only way forward if we're going to have truly a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Uh, have you had uh, much support yet in the Senate? Has there been uh, overtures to the Senate to, to have this passed before the election? Well, certainly it's compelling uh, to, to senators, uh, particularly indigenous senators, but to, to a great number of, of senators, they're going to have to look at the legislation and do, uh, do the study that they, that they do in the Senate. Uh, there is some eagerness to engage, uh, and clearly initial discussions with senators are, are, are very positive. But again, they have to scrutinize and do the process that they do in the Senate uh, and exercise the role that they're constitutionally mandated to exercise. Uh, Ms. McLeod, uh, again, I'm referring back to the AFN uh, Chiefs Assembly that uh, Andrew Shear spoke at uh, last month. Uh, he, he said the, pr the proposed legislation we're talking about, Child Welfare and the Indigenous Languages Act, he would give it due consideration in time. What exactly does he mean by that? I think absolutely. Um, obviously, we support uh, and recognize Indigenous language. The welfare, child welfare, is going to be very important. But until you actually see what's tabled, you can't, um, you know, fully say that we're behind this. So we're behind the concept. Absolutely, we will not stand in the way of it progressing. But we're going to do our job in terms of, you know, what the legislation actually looks like. But I have to point out that. We only have 14 weeks left. I know that the minister a week and a half ago did this big news conference and you know said we're going to move forward with this, we're going to co-develop. I mean, we first heard about this three years ago. We heard everyone talking about it three years ago. So the fact that we're 14 weeks left and then you know what they're going to do is they're going to maybe table it in late January, early February. And then they're going to say, oh, well, we don't have time for you to do the diligence that you should do. It's kind of like that um, additions to reserve. It was hidden in the budget bill, 802 pages. At the AFN, I asked a whole number of chiefs, were you aware about the changes in addition to reserve? They didn't, many of them said, oh, we had no idea that this was hidden in a budget bill. So my big concern is what's taken so long and now of course there's going to be an important press to move it forward but really you know 
do we have time to do the job that we were actually supposed to do? And have they done the job even before it comes to the table that they're supposed to do? F3, we sure found out they hadn't. Uh, Ms. Ashton, uh, of course the NDP does support this. Uh, your leader uh, was on here a few weeks ago. Uh, so what's your reaction to what you've heard just now? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that uh, while we welcome, obviously, uh, uh, you know, the, the prioritization placed on uh, child welfare legislation and Indigenous languages, and, um, you know, actually on the Indigenous languages front, uh, my own colleagues, Romeo Saganash and Georgina Jolibois, have been champions from the beginning uh, when it comes to uh, the need for federal leadership on this front. Um, I will say that, uh, uh, you know, they, they certainly have left, the Liberals have left this until the last minute. Um, I'm not sure why they were, they've been pushing the Indigenous rights framework that has been uh, uh, opposed significantly for such a long time instead of actually going through with with critical legislation on child welfare and indigenous languages uh, we're keen to see what this legislation looks like and then we'll see exactly how we go forward but I will say when it comes to child welfare uh, we've uh, we've made it very clear that indigenous communities need to be at the forefront of uh, um, both uh, uh, you know designing the, the kind of uh, programming that's necessary and directing uh, uh, this this funding. Uh, when it comes to Indigenous languages, we need to see sustained funding. You know, governments, both Liberals and Conservatives, have uh, thrown piecemeal funding, and uh, and it's no wonder that uh, it's such a struggle to provide uh, Indigenous language uh, uh, supports and, and education. There needs to be sustained funding, and, and we will be watching for all of that. Uh, uh, of course, your leader again said there has to be specific targets. Uh, he said that at the AFN uh, uh, Chiefs Assembly. Uh, I've also spoke to, uh, interviewed uh, Indigenous Services Minister Jane Philpott about this uh, right after and asked, well, is this going to change in three to five years? And she wasn't, uh, she was hesitant on when this uh, might happen and when uh, we might actually see, uh, flip the switch on this issue. I guess what, for the NDP perspective, what is your target on this? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, I, uh, I think what's, uh, what's critical for us is to see that uh, um, child welfare and, and, well, frankly, in anything that uh, the government is investing in with respect to Indigenous communities is, uh, uh, is being tracked, that we're seeing how, uh, uh, how effective uh, the government's uh, uh, investments are. Uh, you know, is our communities receiving the money? I know uh, back home, uh, you know, oftentimes you hear about funding that uh, stops in Winnipeg and trickles down to the communities, takes too long. Uh, doesn't respond to the, the priorities of the communities. Uh, so I think for us it's really important to see that uh, the money, uh, uh, you know, it gets uh, uh, put in right away and that uh, that it makes a difference on the ground. Um, you know, and, and once again, you know, in the, in the last year of the government's mandate to see all of a sudden emphasis placed on, on uh, child welfare after we know the numerous, uh, um, uh, the numerous um, messages from the Human Rights Tribunal uh, is, uh, is, you know, it doesn't speak of a great pri uh, priority. We welcome the direction, uh, but we're certainly keen to see uh, what uh, the bill actually looks like. Uh, Mr. Miller, I'm just going to focus uh, on the uh, Indigenous Languages Act uh, again, and I'm going to talk about targets and goals for that. Uh, uh, what is the target or goal? I mean, can Indigenous languages, especially the ones on the brink of extinction, be saved by this legislation? Well, look, we're talking about dozens and dozens of languages, some in an extremely, as you mentioned, precarious position. Uh, the solutions are in communities, and, and we've recognized that. And I just want to address quickly what my, my colleagues of their concern with respect to legislation. We've had a massive engagement with, with stakeholders, and in order uh, to renew this nation-to-nation -nation relationship, you can't just ram legislation down people's throats. This is something we've tried in the past for decades and for centuries, and it just doesn't work. So that engagement process is key to ensuring that we have the right tools and then the right legislation to engage. What we've heard on, on language is that in, 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 in a number of communities, the resource is already there. It's, it's staffed by people people who have struggled against the government to, to maintain uh, languages and structures that have been ripped by them, either consciously or, or unconsciously by government or, or government-like institutions when we, talk, when we talk about the church, for example. Uh, it, if you give those people the tools in order to vitalize languages, they're off to the races and you can double, triple uh, language acquisition skills w within a relatively short-term short period. Now the challenge we have as politicians is that we think in four or five-year cycles. 
uh, sometimes in 10 year cycles. But the test of vitality of a language is over 30 years, what the language transmission from, from parents to children. And uh, we, we, for that ultimate goal to be achieved, most if not all of us won't be around. But if you put the tools in place, if you put the institutions in place, and you trust the people that are best suited uh, Indigenous teachers to transmit that language, whether it's the K-12 to system, whether it's the immersion system for people of an, of an older age, or at the very, uh, very young age. Um, I've been to schools, I've been to, I've been to uh, Akwesasne Freedom School, uh, various immersion courses, and what you see is children uh, that are very happy in their environment, uh, learning, learning their language, uh, and, I, and I joke that it's the only time I, say I go into a school setting and people are actually happy, uh, whether it's in the immersion schools or, 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 or these types of um, uh, schools where people are reacquiring their language. So this, 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 it's, it's great for Canada as a nation, uh, and, and we repeat that a lot, but what it is best for is for Indigenous communities that are, that are, that are reacquiring languages and in a lot of cases have been, have, have been stripped from them. Um, through government action. So we're righting a wrong, um, but we need to have the people in place uh, in order to guide us and as to, as to best do it. And as, as Ms. Ashton said, the money's got to be there. Uh, Ms. McLeod, uh, of course, uh, yeah, there has to be engagement with the communities. Uh, this eventually, this legislation has to go to committee as well, probably the Indigenous Affairs Committee, which, uh, of course, you sit on. Uh, what will be your focus or your approach when you're uh, uh, listening to uh, witnesses? Will it be uh, Financial or how effective this uh, this legislation will be? Well, I think unfortunately, first the language bill was intended to go to heritage, so I was disappointed because I thought it would have been really good to be part of our committee. And I understand that the child welfare, when it's ultimately tabled, will be going um, to the Indigenous Affairs Committee. So the thing that um, what we found, and I'm going to use the example of S3 when the the department came, they insisted that they had done proper process and that they were going to be dealing appropriately with, at that time it was a court decision around gender equity. And then as we started to hear from the witnesses, we learned that there was lots of flaws in the legislation. So that's why, you know, it was certainly Andrew Shear said we need to see the legislation. Obviously, you know, the principles are important, but what we found with S3, of course, they had to go right back to the drawing board because they didn't get it right. The rights and recognition framework, at least they haven't tabled legislation, but they're still way back at the drawing board and some huge challenges with that. So, you know, certainly my first priority is going to be seeing have they got this right in terms of, you know, the communities that is going to impact the most? Are they, are they with the government or are we going to have a whole lot of communities that are saying this is not going to work, it's impractical? Because, of course, that was, S3 sounded great until you started to dig into it. Uh, Ms. Ashton, I'll give you the last word on this topic. Uh, well, I mean, you know, looking forward to, again, what, what the, the government has in store. Uh, like I've said, uh, you know, proud of the work that we've done championing uh, all of these issues, uh, uh, particularly languages, but also the need for justice when it comes to child welfare. And, uh, you know, communities need to be at the forefront of devising these programs and, uh, and, and certainly speaking to, to uh, uh, whether or not this legislation is, uh, is what they need. Uh, and, and uh, you know, at the end of the day, without sustained funding on any and all fronts when it comes to the challenges in digital Indigenous communities face, and particularly on issues like language, uh, you know, we, we can't go forward. You know, as somebody who uh, didn't grow up speaking either English or French, uh, you know, I know how challenging it can be to learn one's uh, uh, mother tongue, uh, and what is necessary is for there to be supports all throughout, uh, and, uh, and the federal government needs to be there. Okay, I uh, want to thank you for that, and uh, we'll be talking about, after the break, we're going to talk about the UN Declaration on Indigenous Peoples. I know when people talk, for example, about the Trans Mountain Pipeline, they talk, oh my goodness, it's a 700% increase in tanker traffic. What they don't tell you is it's going to increase by one a day. There's nothing that's stopping, um, you know, more ships from Alaska, more ships from, uh, you know, Walmart coming in. Still with our panel of MPs, we debate Bill C-48, which is currently in the Senate. It proposes a moratorium on tanker traffic off British Columbia's north coast. But there's a sharp division among First Nations that support the bill and those that oppose it. A month ago, there were two press conferences by the opposing groups held within days of each other. Each had been in Ottawa to lobby senators about C-48. In the second round, Ms. Ashton, I'm going to start with you with another bill that's actually currently in the Senate, and that's the uh, and it's divided First Nations. That's Bill C-48. Uh, 
It's the moratorium on tanker traffic. We've had competing press conferences on First Nations on both sides of this issue. Uh, your colleague Nathan Collins' constituency is kind of ground zero for this on the north coast of BC. Uh, what is the message being sent to First Nations who are against Bill C-48? Mm -hmm. Well, I know from our end uh, it was very important, and of course uh, my colleague Nathan Cullen was uh, very much at the forefront of, of, uh, of, of fighting uh, uh, alongside First Nations in his riding I, for I guess, ultimately what C-48 is, uh, uh, has, has allowed for uh, and, and against uh, the proposed pipeline in, in, in his region. Um, you know, what, uh, what was clear was the need for uh, First Nations to be heard on not wanting tanker traffic in their waters in some of the most pristine and, and uh, fragile ecosystems in, in, uh, in the country, frankly. And, um, you know, for us it was important to support this piece of legislation um, and, uh, and, and, and hear First Nations who who were very much uh, uh, eager to see this uh, this kind of legislative support. Now we do realize, obviously, there is opposition to this bill. Um, you know, it's important to, to hear that as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we're talking about is um, uh, is, is is the the well-being of the environment, is the ability for uh, communities as well to be able to engage in, in uh, uh, industries, including traditional industries like fishing, and uh, you know, and and, and really um, um, issues of health and safety as well. And, and we believe that those uh, uh, safeguards need to be in place uh, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's been important for us from the beginning. Of course the moratorium just kind of puts a cap on what's already happening. You've, you've already got tankers coming down from Alaska uh, to Washington State. Uh, so what about that then? If we're concerned about the environment, shouldn't we be getting rid of all everything? Uh, well, I, I think that, that uh, certainly as, as, as we were putting it forward, the issue was more in terms of uh, um, uh, expanded um, uh, traffic and, and in relation to a pipeline as well, uh, which is obviously uh, was a major, uh, major concern. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that, uh, I mean, there's, there is definitely room for improvement on all fronts, ensuring the safety of, of uh, uh, coastal communities. Um, you know, even, even the current state of affairs is, uh, you know, we're not uh, well, right along the West Coast. Is is not uh, uh, where it needs to be in terms of uh, ensuring safety, but um, um, like I said, from our end, it was really important that uh, that there be something in place for First Nations to be able to oppose uh, expanded traffic, including that uh, that would come from a, a proposed pipeline. Uh, Ms. McLeod, your party's been very concerned about the uh, uh, economic aspects of the industry, uh, energy industry, that uh, jobs are being lost, investment is fleeing the country. Uh, if Bill C-48 passes, is it a piece of legislation you'd perhaps like to see overturned if there's a Conservative government? Absolutely. Um, if you talk to Eagle Spirit, and they came and did a very comprehensive presentation, and they also did a shared a study in terms of the safest ports to actually move, and their plan would actually end with one of the safest ways to take oil to market. So, so of course, what they're saying is, you know, it's fine for the government to say they've consulted when they're closing things down or they don't want to allow things to happen. They consult when they don't want to allow things to happen, but they don't do the vice versa. So, so they're actually looking to challenge the government in court. I'm not sure if they've officially done this yet. But they gave some very compelling arguments around the safety of their plan and also the nature of their partnership and what their opportunities would be economically. This doesn't relate, but I know when people talk, for example, about the Trans Mountain Pipeline, they talk, oh my goodness, it's a 700% increase in tanker traffic. What they don't tell you is it's going to increase by one a day. There's nothing that's stopping, um, you know, more ships from Alaska, more ships from, uh, you know, Walmart coming in. So when we're talking about Kinder Morgan and that 700% increase, it is only one sh ship a day, and I think people need to, you know, understand that and understand what's happening. Um, you can see pictures of the the traffic, and all of a sudden Canada is going to put itself at an incredible disadvantage in terms of what's happening around the world. Um, and really, I don't think it's going to be of good impact. So I think listening to what Eagle Spirit has to say, listening to what you know their plans are in terms of the port that they plan to would like to exit out of, and what the opportunities are, are also an important part of the equation. Uh, Mr. Miller, I know this is uh, a bit out of your purview as Parliamentary Secretary of Crown and Indigenous Relations. Uh, I did speak to uh, the Chief of the Burns Lake First Nation a couple of weeks ago. He's uh, anti-C-48. 
Uh, and his reason is uh, where his uh, community is situated, there's no, it, he doesn't have good real estate, he said, and there's no room for economic growth. So uh, what do you say those communities are, are desperate for economic growth uh, who may not be on the coast, uh, but they could benefit from uh, this Eagle Spirit pipeline? Well, look, first off, it should come, uh, particularly as no surprise to anyone watching this show, that, that First Nations have different views on, and different views within communities on, on, uh, on pipelines on, on a variety of issues. Uh, as Ms. Ashton said, this, this, uh, this bill will, will move to protect a pristine part of our country uh, from essentially the northern tip of Vancouver Island. Uh, northwest, so uh, it, 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 it is an expression of this government's uh, desire to get our resources uh, to international markets in, in a responsible fashion, uh, and that includes protecting the environment. We've, we've invested a billion dollars in ocean protection, uh, and, and this tanker ban uh, will achieve another part of that, which is ensuring international assuring to our international partners that we are we are, we are doing uh, we are exploiting. Ex exporting our natural resources in a, in, in, in a responsible fashion. So uh, this, this, this strikes the right balance. Uh, as to the First Nations, we absolutely have to partner uh, with them to ensure economic development is another important element of governance. Um, again, there won't be agreement overall, and, 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 this, and, and I won't use a particular nation to, to, to push forward my own point of view. I, 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 I represent the government, and uh, we believe this strikes the right balance, uh, and we're, we're ready to partner with any First Nation that uh, wants to develop on, according to their own uh, according to their own agenda. Well, uh, we could certainly talk more about uh, uh, these issues, but we're out of time, unfortunately. I want to thank you for doing this, and uh, you'll be going back to your constituencies, and uh, we'll see you again at the end of January. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Merry thank Christmas you. and oh. happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs> thank you. We'll have more after another short break. Parliament is adjourned now, and when parliamentarians return, the House and the Senate will be in new locations here in Ottawa. Centre Block is now closed for renovations that are expected to last at least a decade. But before we go tonight, here is the last answer given by Prime Minister Trudeau during question period in the Old House on an issue affecting Indigenous people. It's on the lack of bus services in northern Saskatchewan, and was asked by NDP MP Georgina Jollybois. Mr. Speaker, with the closure of STC in Saskatchewan, people with disabilities in northern Saskatchewan are being left in the dark by the Liberals. People like Gary Tinker from Pine House, Saskatchewan are forced to hitchhike across the province to get to appointments to see their families or just to live a normal life. People with disabilities can't wait until after the election. What are the Liberals waiting for to help Northerners like Gary and restore the bus service? Well, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we were extremely concerned with the decision by Greyhound to suspend uh, bus service uh, uh, across parts of the north and the west. And that's why we've been working with local communities, why we've been working uh, with other providers to ensure that there are alternatives in place, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have created programs uh, in partnering and allowing uh, Indigenous communities to step up. We recognize this situation uh, is uh, difficult on top of an already difficult situation. That's why we're working in partnership with Indigenous communities to solve this problem. And I thank the member opposite for her question and for her work on this file. The Honourable Member for Well, that's it for this week's episode. If you missed any part of tonight's show or any other, you can check out our podcasts. Go to aptnnews.ca slash podcast. I'm Todd Lamoran. Thanks for watching.